Welcome to this month's teacher training video. Glad you're here and glad today to have with us Dr. Jeannie Bland. I think we met August 2006, Lambert Airport, right here in St. Louis. <laughs> Jeannie and I have been friends since then, but I came here uh, to teach at Gateway College of Evangelism where she was academic dean and my boss. And so we had uh, just a wonderful time learning, teaching, and I said in our last video, that your passion for teaching and teaching teachers just mm -hmm. really inspired me with the book that I've just done and uh, I've been able to speak at some places where you have and just see you in action. It's exciting. <laughs> your passion for teaching just comes across and so you guys are in for a treat today. Talk to us. Let's get started there. What inspires this passion that you have for teaching in the church? Way to set me up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. No pressure. Um, Take yeah, it no pressure. Um, what inspires my passion for teaching in the church? I don't remember not being passionate about teaching. When I was a little girl, I taught when most kids played house. I would sit my sister up and I would teach her. But teaching as Christian educators, teaching within the church, I think that passion hit me. It was at an Illinois district camp, and it would have been in the late 80s, early 90s, as, uh, when I would have been at senior camp. I distinctly remember I could walk to the place now where I was, where God called me to teach as a Christian teacher in Christian environments. And so at that point, I, I guess it was birthed from the calling that I had and from the fact that I had always been raised in that environment. I went to a Christian school and I was, I was able to go to Bible college after that. And, and my other degrees were in schools that were, were Christian, intentionally Christian. It, I, it just made sense that if you're training an army, the people who are training the army should not belong to the enemy. And so because of that, being an educator in a Christian setting has always, I don't know if that's answering the question yeah. you want, but that's yeah. always been <clears throat> of paramount importance to me. You will, you will maybe make less money in, in a field that's Christian education, but you will never make less of a difference ever. Oh, yeah. And so it's, I, can't, I can't imagine doing anything else, yeah. truthfully. Oh, yeah. So that was a very long way of saying yeah. I was called to it. There you go. <laughs> well, so we've got teachers out there who can testify of similar experiences. Uh, there are also those people that I say, if you were just walking across the parking lot on Wednesday night and pastor waves you down and says, hey, we need some help <laughs> in the toddler class, you just got called, right? So yeah. it's a different kind of calling, but it's still God's blessed you <laughs> with the opportunity to minister to others. Okay, so what I love about you, we could talk about the fact that you have your doctorate in education. We talk about you've been on the faculty of Gateway College of Evangelism and now Urshan College mm -hmm. in the education department. You've had these wonderful experiences in the formal field of education, right. but what I love is that you have that passion and you believe in this. Mm -hmm. Let's try to put those two things together right now. For those of us who haven't had some of those opportunities <clears throat> to learn about the theory and philosophy of education, help us in understanding in a classroom setting in the church, what's happening? What's that learning process look like? Talk to us maybe about, about that learning process the learning process with within the church itself as yeah. with the christian educators that is actually i teach semesters on that subject yeah. so this should be this seconds. should be interesting yeah. um <clears throat> for me to just wedge it right in there yeah. um <clears throat> the the process of teaching you can never go wrong as teachers the number one thing is you model yourself after the, the master teacher it is, it's insane to try to do it any other way. You can look at all the psychology in the world, and you should. And you should look, you can look at all the educational theories in the world and absolutely educate yourselves in those areas. But understand, if you want to do something right, mm -hmm. you do it the way Jesus did it. Yeah. And, it and oddly enough, this is going to just shock you to death, but <laughs> the way Jesus did things, that is what modern psychology shows works the best. Who so give knew? us a for instance. For instance, um, a little things. You start from um, known a, a point of know what they know, where they are, to, and go to the point of unknown. Jesus always started okay. from a point of this is where you are. Let me ask. You. He started with questions. He asked lots of questions, and he waited for answers. That is what good teachers do. He um, loved his students. You will have students that seem unlovable. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Not. That I've right. been doing this two decades. They're going <laughs> to exist. You started with but, six. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was, yeah, I was a very young prodigy. But what you, what you have to do is God himself gives you a supernatural love for those people. Yeah. He has to. Yeah. And, and in teaching these people, 
And in teaching your students, I don't care what age you teach, there is no age that does not need to be taught. Yeah. But when you're teaching according to the plan of the master teacher, you must understand if you do not strongly love your subject as well as your students, you cannot su uh, successfully put those two things together. It doesn't work yeah. that way. Yeah. You have to have a love, a teacher's enthusiasm for his or her subject will ignite a fire in his or her students. Yeah. Um, and that is what... I mean, of course Jesus was excited about the gospel. <laughs> and of course Jesus was enthusiastic about his creation in front of him. Yeah. When he worked with people, they mattered. It was not about finishing the lesson. It was about making sure that their needs were met. And as an educator, that's where it all starts. Yeah. If you have not, when you are finished, and I'm talking specifically to church educators, if you have not created students who by the time you're finished with them, whenever your t tenure with them may be, if they have not come to a point of <clears throat> habitually doing what is right without your input, then you have not truly educated mm. them. They have to come to a point where it's their decision, it's their God, it's their righteousness. Well, sorry, his righteousness working in their life, I guess I yeah. should say. All of those things have to become personal to the student. If it isn't, yeah. you haven't taught them. And so in, in, in from, from cradle to grave, there is no time the church should not be teaching the mm. saints. There is no time. And so, yeah, I've got all kinds <laughs> of information on that. Yeah. But uh, as a teaching church, you follow the master teacher, you cannot go wrong. You yeah. will not mess up. And no matter how you were called, whether it's the call of the pastor saying, oh my goodness, we have nobody to teach junior high, whether it's nobody else is doing it. If I don't do it and you're in that classroom, you have to understand God's sovereign. You got in that classroom, not by accident. Oh. It's his word, his people. He's putting two things he loves together and he's chosen you to do it. You've got to look at it from that perspective. You weren't called by your pastor. It just might've been your pastor's voice or the Sunday school superintendent or whomever's <laughs> voice right. that called you with God's will. Oh, so much good stuff in there. I, I want to like tweet a couple of those <laughs> things, right? Uh, so I, I think I hear you <clears throat> saying that we got to focus on those students and where they are and where they need to be. Because I'll be honest, sometimes teaching is more like a performance and we worry <laughs> so much about like the next trick to keep their attention yep. and the next cool analogy. And I think we can get turned on focusing on ourselves as this performer. And I love what you're saying. I think about where those students are and what anything I'm doing like that that's exciting, engaging, great, but it's only for the sake of helping them right. progress. Right. Yeah. And there is, <clears throat> there is a grid. We've talked about it before. Yeah. I want to say the man's name. I wrote it down and I've promptly forgotten it. I think his name is Noel Burtz, maybe, and it was in the 70s. And it was called the Steps to Competency. And it's a grid. It's a quadrant, four quadrants. And it, you start, at, and it, it has to do with how to learn how to do something, yeah. the competency. But I like to use it in reference to um, into education, into educating people. Right. The first grid is uh, unconscious incompetence. And what that means is you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. That's how I use that. When people come to you sometimes as a Christian educator in your church, in your classrooms, wherever your situation is, they sometimes don't have a clue. Many times don't have a clue what they don't know. Yeah. You, and, and, and their, their ignorance is still a problem. Yeah. Then you move from that as a teacher, you help them move into conscious incompetence. Or you could say conscious ignorance. I know that sounds horrible, but well, it's... Well, but that would be like, okay, now I realize, hey, wait a second, yes. I need to be saved. I need I to be saved. That, yeah, like Acts, what, yeah. 237, yeah. What, you know, what, what, what must we do? And so <clears throat> you move them from a place of unconscious to conscious mm -hmm. incompetence, and then they move into conscious competence, which means I'm teaching you the way to Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah. Here is the path to take. So they are aware and they know what it's going to take. And then they start following it. And the absolute success stories end in the fourth quadrant, which is in unconscious competence, which means I don't have to think about it. I'm just doing what's yeah. right. It's what I do because when the more you become like Jesus, the more his yeah. righteousness shines through and the right things happen. That's where we're trying to get them. Not that it's like, oh, I've got, let me check the list. Oh, that's exactly. what I'm supposed to do here. Mm -mm. But that's just, it's who I am now. This, this and apostolic life is who I am. And if I can interrupt you to say this, we have to be really careful as teachers to worry about, we're all worried about the wow factor. Yeah. The, and we've got the so what. The so what is why do I need to know this? We understand that. But the wow factor is like I've got to tell the right stories. I've got to yeah. get the right hook. I've got to get people listening to me. None of that's wrong. But uh, was it Paul who said, I have not come to you with enticing words of men's wisdom, mm -hmm. with, with power and demonstration? Yeah. 
It doesn't matter how many letters you have after your name. It does not matter how well educated, how good you are at what you do. The power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit yeah. in your classroom. And I'm not talking right. about, if I'm teaching a class on tithing, I do not expect people to necessarily get out of their wheelchairs. Not mm -hmm. that they can't, I just yeah. don't expect that. But that does not mean the anointing cannot right. be demonstrated in that environment. As teachers, I implore you, I don't care what grade you teach, what age you teach, and if you're teaching a toddler Sunday school class, look for God moments. Yes. They will be there. Yes. And that is the power and demonstration of the Holy Ghost. If you don't ha if you have that, yeah. your suspect teaching methods, it's okay. God can work. I mean, right. obviously God worked with a donkey at one point. <laughs> so he can work with anybody. Not that yeah. I'm calling you a donkey, but please understand it, you don't have to worry about you being something special. God will qualify the called. He doesn't necessarily call the qualified. So when you are working with people and you allow those God moments, that is the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. And people's lives will be changed yeah. through that. Yeah, teaching is a spiritual act. We, yep. we should, it can and should expect the work of the Spirit when we teach. And okay. it's an imperative. We're required to yeah. do it. Well, we have had such a great conversation. Thanks for being with us. Come back next month and we're going to talk some more with Dr. Bland on teaching in the church.